Hello and welcome to Ethics and Moral Problems. My name is Dr. Stephen Boino. This particular lecture is on ethics um, pertaining to who we are, so ethics on being, as opposed to ethics that just look as an evaluation or judgment on an act. The two we will look at are virtue ethics and natural law. When we look at what individuals uh, do for a living, we might call that their vocation. But here, if we understand this, you know, as vocare, this, this, this calling, we often see people who just, act, it's almost as if they are fit for their particular positions. It could be um, a waiter or a waitress, that, of course, they're efficient servers, and they calculate our bills and everything correctly, but we're just impressed with how they handle us as individuals. They're friendly. Um... And it seems like there's something within them that matches what they do. We could say the same for um, people who strive for this type of vocation and go into the healthcare field as nurses or physicians, or whether they become lawyers or whether they become businessmen, um, teachers, professors, it, it really doesn't matter. We like it when those individuals have some interiority that matches what they do. So when I use the term obligations here, I don't use that in some legalistic sense but that the waiter recognizes the worth of the person that they're serving, the lawyer, the person they're representing, the medical professional, um, the person that they're um, trying to bring health back to, the professor, to the student that they're trying to teach. So they, they see something there, and there's this inner drive that fits them for that. That's what I mean here. So this is what this type of ethic is to develop, almost always. Our ethical choices um, are between goods, each two in themselves or more, that are in tension with each other. So we're not trying to determine what to do in the sense of, well, this is right and that's wrong, which should I choose, or ethical and unethical, illicit or illicit. Um, there's always something that's good in both of them, and we're trying to weigh those out, which I think developing ourselves interiorly helps with this. For instance... Um, if you're working somewhere, to consider a promotion, that's a good. And also to think that how the time I spend with my family, the relationships I have, those are all good too. So you're trying to weigh out um, this choice you have between the promotion and how it will affect my family. Both of those things are goods. Uh, we could even say within um, any business, uh, profit isn't necessary, regardless of your ethical um, persuasion towards economics if a business doesn't make some sort of profit it won't um, subsist so you always have to make sure that your business is profitable but you also want to take care of the employees make sure they're getting um, family time off uh, they're getting good health care and such those two things always have to be weighed so what we're looking at here is how does developing ourselves interiorly help us towards those goals and then you'll have to make some sort of determination um, to what degree this is practical, or if that practicality should really be the factor that we judge this on. The first one we're going to look at is virtue theory. Virtue theory is always working towards a goal, but not in the same way that consequentialism is. Consequentialism is going to evaluate the, um, the morality or ethic, ethics of the act by what's achieved. This is what is the goal for us as human beings. The ancient Greeks understood that life's goal was happiness, um, eudaimonia. Now, this happiness is not subjective contentment like I like cannolis and I like pizza, that kind of thing. This is what is that one thing that we do for itself and not for something else. For instance, we may understand that having more money will make us happy, but it's not the money itself that makes us happy. It's what money will get us. Um, so whatever that last thing is, this is eudaimonia. Um, the thing we could say which one does or not, for no other uh, reason except for itself. Now, the way that virtue theory worked out with Aristotle and the ancient Greeks is, we'll pick one here, courage. If you were trying to be courageous, then they would understand as a definition that you know, this virtue has to sit between a deficiency and an excess. And wherever that virtue becomes either 
on the scale of excess or deficiency, it is no longer that virtue. So, for example, if a person were in um, battle, it's always easy to use a scenario like that, and they were to run away from any danger, and I mean not just to protect themselves, but because they had a level of cowardice, that would be a deficiency of courage. Likewise, we have to be careful that a person who would rush into something that is absolutely impossible um, to show any effect, like if you want an image, a person running with a sword towards um, a tank, that is not a person who has courage. It might seem like it, but it's actually rashness. It's the excess of courage. So the way that they understood any sort of virtue, where they use this Latin phrase in medio stop vetus, in other words, virtue always stands in the middle. So whatever virtue that we're shooting for, we try to stay away from any extreme, be it deficiency or be it excess. This, for them, the Greek word arete, was this idea of perfection or virtue. So this itself was connected to the happy life, um, the good life. Now, what you need to understand about this is virtue is understood here not just as doing the good thing or being good, but it's that we are doing that well which we are designed for. Here's an example. If you were to hold a knife, um, the Greeks would talk about the virtue of a knife. Now, the reason why we use something like this is so that you don't think that the knife is doing something per se. If the knife uh, was ergonomic, it fit well into your hand, if it felt balanced, if the blade was sturdy, if the blade was very sharp, and for whatever this knife is designed for, does it do it well? If it's a butter knife, we would want something dull. We want something wide blade that would spread butter. So we would say that virtuous knife does what it is designed to do. If it were a deboning knife, it would be very sharp and very thin. Um, filleting knife, you get the idea. So that would be the virtue of the knife, a ray tape. What we'll look at is what then are we then as a design and how would that design fit to how we go out into the world, into our society and interact with each other. Is that a ray tape? And if it is, then that brings us closer to daimonia. So we will leave virtue defined as this habitual disposition because it has to be something that we interiorly hold and it has to be habitual. I mean, it's something that we do over and over. So a person who practices virtue, um, it gets easier to become virtuous. A person who uh, practices some sort of vice or deficiency, it unfortunately becomes easier to do that. Think of somebody who has an addiction, say, even to like uh, tobacco. Um, the more one smokes, the harder it is to break the habit. Um, the more one um, has, if you were smoking, has not smoking, the easier it gets over time. So this habitual disposition, because it's a, the mind and the heart, this isn't purely an intellectual thing. It's because the will is involved in this. So it's between the excess and deficiency, and it's always leading to perfection. So what I want to do is I want to look at um, the four cardinal virtues. Uh, they're called cardinal. In Latin, that term means the hinge. So these are the things upon which our, um, our goodness and our happiness would hinge. The first one is prudence. Now, people hear that term and they often think that it's, you know, being cautious, but it's not. It's applying right reason to action. So it's, what do I do in this particular situation? It's the mother of all virtues. Without this one, all the other virtues fall flat. So the ancient um, maxim was, if you don't, knew, don't know what the prudent thing is to do, then go and find a prudent person and ask them. So this is sort of like a practical wisdom, if you can understand that. And you can imagine how this would fit into all the different fields that we go into. Now, what I want to do is I want to show some of the vices that are contrary to it because it might help flesh out exactly how you understand um, the application of prudence and whatever it is that um, you're pursuing. The first would be envy. So a person who is envious is not doing what they should in that particular instance. But I want to say something about envy. Envy for philosophers is often distinguished from jealousy. Jealousy is that you don't want another person, uh, well, you want whatever it is for yourself, right? So you become jealous of me because you wanted that for yourself. Envy is when you take pleasure in the other person not having it. So maybe an example would be uh, two young toddlers playing with like blocks or toys and the one won't share so the other one um, knocks it over. Um, 
they don't want them to have any pleasure from them either. This would be something contrary to prudence. Um, negligence, this would be when we just, we fail to choose. Um, we almost get stuck sometimes. In other words, there are times when, you know, we don't know how to proceed in a particular situation, and we can almost be stifled. We can almost just um, fall back and, quite frankly, go and do something else. Um, we'll go and binge on Netflix, or, you know, I'm just going to, you know, go for a walk, which is perfectly fine, but not if you're trying to avoid something you really should be doing. Um, so anyway, that would go against right reason to action. This idea of craftiness, this has, they often call this like a carnal prudence because it seems like you're doing the right thing. Now, I'm going to use a cliche of a lawyer who's just a, a, um, you know, a shyster or a car dealer who's just a shwimp, uh, you know, they're just making sales at our expense, you know, literally. It seems like they're very good at what they do. Um, but we do not like that in, like, say, in, a, in politicians. Um, they're crafty. They seem that they can just get any deal through, and they know how to slide in the special, you know, stuff for their particular district, or perhaps to line their own pockets. So, in one way, um, it seems like they're quite good at applying something to a particular action, but it goes against reason. All right. Now, these are in um, hierarchical order. I'll say something about that in a little bit, but nonetheless, the second one is justice. There's many definitions from justice, and this goes all the way back to Plato up until today. We still are arguing about justice with critical theory and such. But justice uh, basically is to give another their due. And that doesn't really solve our dilemma because we could then ask what is due the other person. But whatever is genuinely and truly due, like for a patient that comes into the hospital, they want a restoration of health and they want um, some guidance in their well-being, um, so health and wellness. So medical professionals in justice have to do their best to have a restoration of health or a continuation of health um, or a well-being that is not necessarily the absence, you know, or could be even with the absence of a cure. Um, we all live with chronic issues and such sometimes, so it's not just cure. Nonetheless, justice, whatever the field you're in, it's to give another their due. Now, tail-bearing. Tailbearing is what we normally would call gossip. This is telling falsehoods about other. So you could see that the other is due a particular truth. And this is what we're really focusing on with these first two. And if you're going to tell a falsehood, then you're going against what is due that person. The second one, calumny, this is when you say something to another, it's true, but they have no right to that information. So for instance, it would be telling another person, hey, did you know that, you know, Joe's uncle's an alcoholic? And then all of a sudden Joe says, why in God's name would you say that? And your response might be, well, I wasn't lying. So if we ever catch ourselves saying something, you know, about somebody else, but it's not a lie, it's calumny. It's not the fact that it's um, true is the issue, but that the other person has no right to have information. Which brings us to the third one in this column here, derision. This would be like almost when you make a sport of mocking other people, you know, like scorning others. So you're trying to reduce their character. Um, apparently, that's quite literally something that is not due to that individual out of respect. The third virtue we'll look at is fortitude. Now, this always has to be uh, some difficult good because we don't need um, strength to overcome easy things. You know, if I were eating soup, I don't think we'll have to be strong to make sure I could finish this bowl, I mean, unless there's some particular circumstances. So it's a, it's a matter of endurance, uh, and it's always in pursuing uh, a particularly difficult good. Now, as far as impatience, you know, this we could almost understand as the, the reality that we don't want to endure hardships. So in, sometimes people are impulsive. And this would be a person who is impulsive. And by the way, this is how you should hear this. If any of these particular um, vices or defects of these, whether they're excess or deficiency, fall into our category, then we try to get back to the middle. That's the whole point here. So not wanting to endure hardships. Um, we're just trying to get through it. I want to take a shortcut. I don't want to study to try to get the good grade. I'll find a way to cheat. I don't want to... 
um, really work hard at my job, I'll just try to smooth the boss or something like that. You can come up with your own scenarios. Which brings us to the next one, ambition. Um, individuals who are in it for fame or power. Now, even um, modest paying jobs can still be sought out for particular power. Um, it's no little thing that people often find in small towns, whether it be their planning commission or their borough council, you know, not that it isn't an important position, but people take every little bit of power they have and let it go to their heads. Um, you know, somebody, when they're young, could just be put in charge, like, okay, you're going to be the leader for our softball team, and next thing you know, they think that they're, you know, bringing, you know, Rommel's armory, army into um, North Africa or something, right? So um, we have to be careful that what we want for the other person and what we want to get through this good isn't just based on our, how we could say, motivated by our ambition. This um, third one, overconfidence. Oftentimes this is called like a mock courage. So think when people are motivated by anger or depression and they, la and they like lash out because of that. Uh, you, you can even think of a person who might, and this actually goes up to the example I have up top with the Mediostat Vertu. If a person were in a physical altercation um, just because they're mad, um, this would be rashness. So you found the excess of it. The fourth virtue is temperance. Now, temperance regulates the things that we need. So it's typically uh, pertaining to sex and food. So we could understand it as a properly ordered desire. In other words, we desire those things, and they're pleasurable. If uh, food tasted like wax and if sex was um, um, unpleasurable, then nobody would eat um, nor procreate. So this is properly ordered, though, because we could always take food. You know, if we food is to sustain us and, you know, and sex is to have an expression um, of union between two people, if food became something that we ate purely for pleasure, and it doesn't mean that it's not pleasurable, but if that became our sole goal, then we'd have um, some sort of disorder there. You know, again, properly ordered. The opposite of that is disorder. Um, sexual and conjugal love should be pleasurable, but if a person were doing that just to have the pleasure of themselves against the other person, or in spite of the other person, that too is not properly ordered. So, there are other things, though, um, outside of those that are still going to fall into these as vices. So even when we are angry, this influences our reason. So anger, in many ways, getting back, retribution, this could um, disorder our proper desires. Brutality, any, any perverse pleasure, whatever that might be. It doesn't have to be a, a flat-out physical altercation. Um, but any time that we find pleasure in something perverse it is a form of brutality. The insensibility, um, this is when people go to unreasonable extremes, and this could even be in diets. So, you know, any sort of disorder, whether it be an eating disorder or a sexual disorder, we would talk about insensibility um, in those regards. Now, just real quick, um, these are in order, and the reason why they're in order from prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance is as you go to the top one, prudence, it requires quite a bit of intellectual um, engagement. Um, so there's a lot of reason involved. There is less reason involved in temperance. Now, if you were to read Dante Alighieri's Inferno, you would see people who um, suffer from these uh, vices in, in, in hell, in, in Inferno, in his, in, it, you really should read it. It's one of the greatest poems ever written. You're going to find that the people on the lowest levels of hell, like the, the deepest, or those are the individuals who were like traitors or flatterers, people who, you know, basically were brown nosers because they were using reason in a way that they should not. The people that are in the um, first level of hell or such um, would be those that are in temperance. So, um, and there's this idea, just FYI, of something called contrapasso, where you have individuals who um, suffer the opposite of whatever their defect was on earth. So for those who were sexual perverts on earth, um, they float around aimlessly um, for all eternity because the idea was you couldn't control your desires here on earth, so in eternity you will not be able to control any directions you take. But the reason why 
those are the least um, counted sins, at least according to Dante's view, was because they are just a disordering of something that we genuinely need and not a higher use of intellect to try to um, take down somebody else, we could say. All right. Now, when we talk about um, natural law theory, uh, we have to be clear, clear, first off, that this is not something that you find in nature. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about something that is the nature of the human person. So a discernible order. There's something within the human person that's going to give us a clue exactly how it is that we should align who we are. It's the nature of the individual. This doesn't need to be taught. It could be uh, expounded on, but it isn't a law from the outside. It's a law from the inside. So we could say that it is that which cannot not be known. It's a double negative. Um, there's no way that a person could say, this I did not know. And this is the basis for all the things that we would call the common good, that collective um, you know, ordering that we need in society that helps us all flourish as individuals, both individually and as a community and such. So if we're going to say, I want to work for the common good, you're going to have to say, how do you know what is good? And what is good just can't be what we desire. It has to be something that is genuinely good for us. So how you do this is if X and X could be whatever we're talking about, if X is for a proper human end, in other words, a goal is an end, then X ought to be done. Now, maybe a way to understand this is by analogy. If we were to go to um, our general practitioner and you get to a certain age where they say, look, you know, your fasting glucose levels are, you know, coming up a little bit higher. Um, perhaps you should make sure you cut out refined sugars, watch the carbohydrates and such. Okay, we wouldn't, we'd walk out of there maybe not liking to hear that. But we wouldn't walk out of there saying that's a stupid rule or a stupid law. Because we'd understand that to the best of their ability, they're trying to determine this is the human physiology and this is a diet that would match that human physiology. So all they're trying to do is saying this is the good that matches your human physiology so then whatever it is, proper eating habits, that's the X, then you ought to do this. So what this is attempting to do is the same thing but with our understanding of morality and ethics, not you know a physiological type of thing. So there are five what are known as primary precepts of natural law. Um, do good. Now this isn't like just being good, but this is we always choose that which is good for us. Nobody goes out and tries to do that which is bad for them. So there's always some advantage that we think, so we're always trying to work towards this particular good. The other thing is pursue truth. There's no societies anywhere in the world, nor has there been anything recorded, uh, of even a remote indigenous tribe where everything is um, premised on lies. Um, so when we, we always are asking ourselves, was well, this true? Well, how do I know it? Because we have that innate, this is what this is, an innate desire for that. Um, the third one is self-preservation. Think in terms of this. If we were you know, younger and we're hanging out with our siblings or our cousins and we're playing in a pool and they were holding us underwater, nobody would have to tell us to try to get up out of water so we can breathe. Um, as silly and as obvious as that is, it's because that we have this natural inclination for self-preservation. Um, reproduction, and this would include care, for um, the newborn because we are uh, type of mammals that we are we do not give the woman does not give birth and then the child is on their own there's a long um, you know maturation period that follows that you know you go back to the 1970s and there's plenty of films that show if uh, a young teenage couple a male and female winds up on an island somewhere they'll figure this out I'm not trying to be glib about that it's just that given who we are as individuals, reproduction is not something that simply needs to be told. It needs to be directly ordered, but not told. The other thing in society, we don't um, live near each other simply for protection. That's certainly part of it. Um, but we need each other. We're interdependent. Um, even the fact that we have language. Uh, language is something innate within a human person. We're not born what they call tabula rasa, a clean slate. So language has one... Um, maybe not just one, but it has a primary role to communicate. And if we're built to communicate, we're built to communicate to someone else. Um, the reality is you can't even really think into your thoughts without language. And you can try it, but um, nonetheless. Now, how you then move from this as 
interior to something on the exterior is we're going to apply what's known as secondary precepts to it. So I'll pick the last four. Because we have this um, innate desire to pursue truth, then there has to be a means for us to achieve that. So education. Now, not college education, even though that, that certainly counts, but we see this as something necessary. So in the United States, we have compulsory education, um, at least up into eighth grade, um, but more likely until um, senior high. Um, Self-preservation. And all we're doing here, by the way, is we're taking these primary precepts and we're applying a little bit of reason to it. Okay? So with self-preservation, if I know that I have to preserve myself, and if you know you have to preserve yourself, then I just reason that since I preserve myself, I have to help you preserve yourself and vice versa. Therefore, we should not murder or harm. So these are ways for us to get to particular ethical claims um, without trying to just form a rule or something. Um, if you have a Judeo-Christian background, then you'll recognize these things as evidenced in the Ten Commandments, which many make the claim are just the natural laws written down. Okay, so reproduction, we have uh, this concept of family, and um, that's a way for us to express and enshrine the reproduction. Uh, in society, and, and you can think of anything that would frustrate these. I'm, you know, With society, we have civil laws that have to govern us because we need to interact somewhere. And anything that would frustrate um, societal relations, uh, particularly racism, uh, would be wrong based on that. So you can make a natural law um, against racism. Now the reason now there there are there's a third level here, but we won't get into that today. Um, they're known as um, remote. There are things that are know, knowable, but they're a little more difficult to, to lay out. One would be the principle of double effect. Like how do we determine we should do something when we know that there's going to be a bad effect that flows from it? Um, the other one would be like just war theory. In other words, we know that killing is wrong, but we also know that you know preserving our society is right, so how do we put these things together? So we won't get into those, but those are typically known as the remote precepts, and they're the third level. So each one of these um, lines up with something that we should do or something that we shouldn't do. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because in society, we often um, will frame what we want in terms of rights. So Marianne Glendon... Um, uh, Professor Emeritus, I believe from Harvard, wrote a book called Rights Talk, R-I-G-H-T-S, where um, we tend here in the United States to form all of our desires in, in terms of rights. Um, you know, you don't have the right to talk to me like that. You don't have a right to tell me what to do. You know, and I'm not saying some of those are not true rights. You know, I'm just saying that we use it quite liberally. So the way that rights are determined through natural law, and a lot of our um, civil laws are based on natural law, even if most lawyers aren't familiar with natural law, is that these natural inclinations become duties. So because uh, we have an inclination to pursue truth, we have a duty for education. Um, because we have a, um, a duty for self-preservation, um, we have the duty to not harm others, and so on and so on. Those then are rights because the rights protect the expression, which is the secondary precept, of a primary precept. So because we have um, the primary precept to live in society amongst others, we have duties that, that should follow laws and should, we should have rights that don't allow racism. So as long as you can connect a right through a secondary precept to a primary precept, you know you're on solid ground. And then this, by the way, when I said that which cannot be known as the basis for the common good, this is what establishes the common good. Now, interestingly enough, there have been a couple classic examples that I'm just going to share two with you, because it's quite interesting. If you've ever heard or read of Sophocles and Antigone, I'm sure that you have at least heard of um, the father of, this, I'll just like tell the story, um, Oedipus. Oedipus um, we hear Oedipus complex. We know that from Freudian psychology, where you know a son is um, sexually involved with the mother, or at least loves the mother. So there's this um, one guy, Polynices. He's the son of Oedipus, right? And he has a brother. I won't go through all the various um, names and such. But Oedipus was the ruler of Thebes in ancient Greece, and he unknowingly married his mother. I mean, this is the mythical you know, story behind it. This is where Freud gets it, by the way. 
So when he finds out that he, ha- he mistakenly married his mother, he blinds himself and he, fl- and he flees the city. So what he does is he gives the, um, the throne of the city to his two sons, Polynices and Ateocles. And these two brothers, what they do is they decide to like roll, you know, um, rule in um, alternating years. Like one is this year, one is that year, and such. Okay. Well, the one time, um, Ateocles refused to step down. So what happened is Polynices, the other brother, he then goes to the neighboring um, city, and now we're going to have a war between his homeland of Thebes and um, where Polynices is now. So what happens is, during the battle, both brothers, and you know, this is a Greek tragedy, so everybody always, you know, dies and perishes and nothing ever turns out. So both brothers actually are in hand-to-hand combat with each other, and they kill each other. Okay, after their death, their uncle Creon then takes power. Now, what he does is he buries Eteocles in a very glorious ceremony because he defended the city of Thebes. Polynices, you know, if you went against what they said was the homeland, then you're going to be left out. Now, I know I'm building up to this, but it's important. They're going to be left, he's going to be left out, eaten by animals. He gets no um, ceremonial burial. Now, what happens is, is his sister Antigone shows up. Now, Antigone starts to make the claim that this isn't right. And anybody who is going to go out and try to bury Polynices is going to be buried alive. So this is high stakes. But she also says it doesn't matter because whoever it, whoever it was that said this, and I guess I could just read you right from um, the actual text because it is kind of you know interesting. Here's what Antigone says. It was not Zeus who made this proclamation, God, nor was it justice dwelling within the gods below who set in place such laws are these for humankind, nor did I think your proclamation had any strength, that mortal as you are, you could outrun those laws that are the gods. They are unwritten, and they are unshakable. Their laws are not now for just now or yesterday, but they live on forever. So, I have the line there. So in other words, she found something that was a law that was not written down. And that law was more important and higher than any law that was given in the land. So I won't go into the story here. It's not that long of a play. You could probably go on YouTube and you can find something like that. But what Aristotle was one of the first ones to take this um, play, Antigone from Sophocles, and say, look, this is an application of natural law. So it's that thing which we do. Nobody arrests a talus about it. And we're going to do it regardless of what the laws are out in the world. Um, the last one that I want to play play for you or work out here is Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham prison. Now, you have to understand and set the stage here if you're not familiar with it. The reality is, is that Martin Luther King was a pacifist and he was nonviolence, nonviolent. So, and he, was, and he, he always insisted that anybody who um, follows him or is part of his movement does not break laws, um, which is sort of an irony because he's in prison because he broke a law. And people are calling him a hypocrite. In other words, you always advocate for you know keeping the law, and here you are, now you're in prison. Now, I want you to keep in the back of your head as I read just part of this um, letter. He wrote this in prison without the use of the Internet. And you can hear his philosophical and theological um, education, because he went to Boston. Um, you can hear that showing up. So this might give you a sense of how applicable this is. So what he's going to try to do, at least in the part of his letter that I'm reading, um, is that he's going to try to make the claim that he really didn't break a law. And, he, and he's going to do it so skillfully. In other words, we might, you probably hear most people on the news say, well, that's just, you know, bull crap. And, you know, the law is, you know, just, you know, not even real. And that's why he did it. So you're just wrong in calling him a hypocrite. If you can learn um, to be articulate, you're going to silence Uh, your oppressors. So here's what he says. He goes, How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law and the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, and this is natural law. An unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in the eternal law and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. Now he's talking about segregation here because this was the anti-segregation protest is what got him here. So he says all segregation statutes are unjust 
because segregation distorts the soul and it damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregator a false sense of inferiority. Segregation, to use the terminology of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship, and it ends up relegating persons to the status of things. So you can see right here that he is one, primary precept one, do good, two, pursue truth, and five, societal. He's hitting three of those natural precepts. He goes, hence, and this is his final part of the argument, hence segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, it is morally wrong and awful. Paul Tillich said that sin is separation. Is not segregation an existential expression of man's tragic separation, his awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness? Thus, it is that I can urge men to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court, for it is morally right but I could also urge them to disobey the segregation ordinances for they are morally wrong. What he's saying, in essence, is according to natural law, which that law is not based in, it is not a law. So I am in prison unjustly because I have broken nothing, and I will listen to the law that is unwritten before I listen to the law that goes against the unwritten. The same thing Antigone said. I'm going to listen to the law that Zeus has laid down and that no king can overcome. So this is the um, benefit, I could at least say, that of natural law. Now, I won't go into the critique here, but I'll let you guys work it out. Um, two broad critiques is how could we universalize these? I mean, maybe we don't always share the exact type of truth, and maybe we don't weigh these things out. Uh, what level do we put between self-preservation and society? You could see that playing out today, even in COVID and such. Um, and because maybe they can't be universalized, how do they help um, lawyers when they're trying to you know, do good to their client, medical professionals when they're taking care of their patients, um, business people and professors with, teach, you know, with students and so on. So those are some of the broad critiques of it. But nonetheless, I hope this is at least an insight into um, an understanding of um, being in terms of who we are and how that plays out as mutual obligations we have for each other. Thank you for listening.